Uh, all right, hey, to start out tonight, we're going to uh, be looking at the books of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. And uh, we're actually going to look at them in a little different order. We're going to do Ezra, then Esther, and Nehemiah. You'll see why when we look at the chronology of those books. But these are the last three of the historical books of the Old Testament. So these trace that narrative spine, tracing the history of Israel. These are the final three books. And so you might be looking in your Bible saying, there's, there's a whole lot more books still, though. Well, that's because there are also the writings and the prophets. And so now that you have, once we finish this, now that you have the narrative spine down, then when we go through and look at the, the writings, so Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and when we look at the prophets, you're going to understand the narrative context where these different writings happen now. So now you have a grid to filter that through. So, excited for that. Uh, but to start out tonight, we're going to start out in Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 11, verses 19 to 20. Because when we reach the end of the historical narrative portion of the Old Testament, um, it's a story that's begging for an ending. And so the end is not the end. At the end of the story, we're going to discover that Israel is still waiting for a heart transplant. And so that's, I want that in your mind, because that's going to characterize some of the stuff that we're reading in Ezra and Nehemiah, especially when we look at the conduct of the people. We're going to see some, some squirreliness happening, even though they've just come out of captivity. And it's because they need this heart transplant. And so here's what God says to the people through uh, Ezekiel the prophet. He says this, I will give them one heart and a new spirit I will put within them. So a couple things to note. Uh, one heart, a unified, united heart, and this new spirit. And so I capitalize, the capitalization is mine, but it's referring to the Holy Spirit. That's going to come and be placed within them, indwelling his people. And so God purposes to give them this, this united heart and the Holy Spirit. Why do they need the Holy Spirit? Well, because, he, as we keep reading, it says, I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh. Does it seem like at times when we've read the story of the Old Testament that the people's hearts are hearts of stone? That they're difficult to correct? Their ears are slow to hear. Their minds are slow to obey. So that's describing this, the spiritual condition of the hearts of the people. He says, I'm going to remove that and give them a heart of flesh. Now, of course, if you remember back to Bible study methods, he's not speaking literally. He's speaking figuratively. They need, they need a soft heart, not a hard heart, a soft heart. They do have a physical heart of flesh, but they need a spiritual heart of flesh. And we understand that because then when we get to the purpose statement— that. So why is God going to do this? Why is he giving them this new heart with the spirit within him? The purpose is that they may walk in his statutes, keep his rules, and obey them. The people have difficulty hearing God's word, internalizing it, and then externalizing it with words, thoughts, actions. And so this new heart that the Lord's going to give them with the spirit of God within them is going to help them to walk in his ways, to keep his laws, and to obey God. That's what will happen when God gives them this new heart and new spirit. And, and why is he going to do this? Because he says, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. So the good news is, they are still his people. This is what God says to them on Mount Sinai, Exodus chapter 19, when they're making that ascent up the mountain, and, and Moses brings back word from them, that covenant from God. He says, you're going to be my people, and I'm going to be your God. God still intends for them to be his people, but he intends to help them to be fully the people they ought to be with this new heart. And so Israel, in the text we're looking at, and at the end of this story, they're still waiting for this heart transplant that comes. The heart transplant that comes in the new covenant. When Christ comes, lives the perfect life, dies, rises again, and then sends the Holy Spirit to indwell believers. So that's what we're looking forward to from the text today. Um, so but we still got a review. So why are we studying the Old Testament? Hopefully you have seen over the course of the past 12 weeks together that the Old Testament really has a lot of good application for our lives. And so it's not just uh, the old stuffy historical, but it's, it's living, it's active, sharper than a double-edged sword. It's fully inspired and applicable to our lives. And we've seen over the course of Israel's entire history, there is one person in the story who hasn't changed. One person who hasn't failed, one person who hasn't behaved inconsistently, and that's God. 
And so hopefully you have seen over the thousands of years of Israel's history that God is consistent in his character, in his nature. And so we can trust the character of God based on what we've seen over our survey of the Old Testament. You can glean wisdom from the pitfalls of the past. We've seen a lot of pitfalls. We're going to see some pitfalls even today. But we can glean wisdom. We can be uh, wiser and smarter because we can learn from them. And hopefully as well, the text we just read is one of these pointing forward to Christ. But hopefully you've seen that this Old Testament narrative gives us a desperation for Jesus. Like I mentioned, it's a story begging for an ending. And Christ is the ending of the story in his, in his first advent and second advent. And so uh, gives us de- desperation for Jesus. And lastly, grasping those promises fulfilled in Jesus. Now we understand what it means that, that he's the, the king of Israel. Now we understand what it means that he's the great high priest. These threads are coming together now as we understand the ministry Christ is accomplishing. So that's why, we, that's why we're looking at the Old Testament. We want that for our souls. Um, and as we're looking at these three books, we're going to address them all together because these three kind of hang together. But we're going to ask the question, who is God in the books of Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther? How, is the, how do these three books point to Jesus, and how does it fit in the story of salvation? So starting off, uh, on page 129 of your manual, page 129, that's where you're going to have this chart that just gives you a brief overview of how these books fit together in the history of Israel. Uh, because these books aren't placed in chronological order. Uh, it's, it's Ezra, and then Esther, if we're going chronological, and then Nehemiah would be the conclusion. Uh, and so you can see that here, where Esther's actually down here. Uh, but there's the post-exilic period refers to uh, after exile. Post-exilic, after exile. And it covers uh, this span of time between uh, the captivity and the years of silence. At the end of this period of time, Malachi is going to speak, and he's going to be the last prophet. And then there will be 400 years of silence. No more inspired word, no more, no more prophets writing, silence until Christ comes. And so this is the period of time we're talking about. And there's three key phases that happen. We have Zerubbabel, Ezra, and Nehemiah leading three different returns to the land. And Zerubbabel, the way to remember what he does, Zerubbabel rebuilds the rubble. So that he's the first one that comes back, and he rebuilds. When he gets back, there's nothing. It's just rubble still. And so he starts rebuilding that. Ezra comes back, and he, he reinstitutes temple worship. And so uh, Dr. Mock here is listed as he rebuilds the people. He helps the people to start following God again in terms of temple worship. And then Nehemiah, or Nehemiah, depending on how you want to say it, he comes back and rebuilds the wall. And then he and Ezra together help Israel continue to follow God during that period of time. And so those are the three returns. But within that, we can see that Esther happens during this gap between the first and second return. And so I'll point out the spots to you where there's gaps in our text, where there's time that passes that you might not notice unless you realize the chronology of what's happening. Uh, but Esther takes place within this kind of 57-year gap there. And if you're, if, you, if you're looking for a chart like that, I don't, I don't have handouts for you, but... If you got your study Bible, 579 is where you can see the timeline of the three books that we're looking at tonight. And we're going to look at them in chronological order. So we'll start with Ezra, then move to Esther, and finish with Nehemiah. So that way it's chronological for you as we're covering those books tonight. So that's on 579. And then another helpful page, just to take note of, 574 in your study Bible is going to cover the routes that they take for the returns. Because the first return, they come from Babylon here in return. And for the second and third, they follow a different route to get back to the land. But they all end up back in Jerusalem. So that's just helpful if you're a visual learner. That's just helpful to see the, the picture of where they're coming from. All right, so Book of Ezra. Go ahead and turn to the, the Book of Ezra if you're not there already from looking at the maps and whatnot. Uh, but the Book of Ezra. Ezra covers the... Uh, covers the return here, the first and second returns. Uh, the title of the book, the title of the book refers to the key leader of the book, whose name is Ezra. And so uh, Ezra is the um, central figure in terms of the human leader. And it's likely that he's also the author of the book. We're not certain on that. There's no author named for us. But there's two reasons why we think that. One is that when Ezra arrives in Jerusalem in chapter 7 of his book, he begins to use the first person to refer to himself. And so uh, it, it seems like, okay, it seems like he's the one writing here. Now it could be that someone's taking his notes and compiling them. We're going to see that in Nehemiah. 
uh, but it's likely because of the first person usage. And Ezra, because he was a scribe, would have access to the library of Persia. And if you read through the book of Ezra, you'll notice that there's several of the king's edicts and speeches that are recorded for us word for word. And so Ezra, being a scribe, would have access to that library. So he, he would have access to that as well as Nehemiah's journals and things. And so that's why we likely think it's Ezra. Uh, written between 550, 457 and 444 B.C., and it covers the first and second returns from captivity. So there's three waves of, uh, of exiles that are going to come back to the land, three parades heading back to, the, to Jerusalem. And Ezra covers the first two. And the key theme you have to catch when you're reading the book of Ezra is that the hand of the Lord is at work. Ezra's going to say a couple times that the hand of the Lord is upon him in the work that he's doing. And he's going to say that the hand of the Lord is with them, the hand of the Lord is for them. And so the hand of the Lord... Uh, it's an anthropomorphic term because we're giving God human attributes. God doesn't have physical hands like you and I do, but we're saying he's actively involved. He's hands-on in the situation. So when it uses the hand of the Lord, God's actively working here. And so just as God uh, in the books of First and Second Kings was actively opposed to the evil kings, God is actively now restoring his people to the land. So we've got to catch the activity of God in this book. And uh, MacArthur puts it this way in the study Bible. This is from your study Bible. It says this, God orchestrated the past grim situation, the captivity, and would continue to work through a pagan king and his successors to give Judah hope for the future, for the return. And so the hand of God is active in both. So page 133, that's where you'll have the overview of the book of Ezra. Two, two basic divisions. Chapters 1 through 6 covers Zerubbabel leading the people back to the land, and then 7 through 10 covers Ezra's return. So Zerubbabel and then Ezra, two clean sections of the book. So let's look at the book together. Ezra chapter 1, we see this proclamation of Cyrus. Now this is the same proclamation that we concluded the book of Chronicles with, and it says this in chapter 1 verse 1. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you of all his people, may his God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem, and let each survivor, whatever place he sojourns, be assisted by the men of his palace with silver and gold, with goods and with beasts, besides freewill offerings for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. A couple of key things to notice. First of all, we see that the, the divine author tells us this is fulfilling what Jeremiah has prophesied, that Cyrus would make this proclamation. Cyrus as acknowledges, remarkably, pagan king acknowledges the lordship of God. He says, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me these kingdoms. And so it makes me wonder, does he know what Daniel has said about the, about the kingdoms and how one would replace another? Is he aware of that prophecy and sees the hand of God moving from kingdom to kingdom with Persia now being in control? And so that's remarkable. He sees God's hand even in his own reign. And so he acquiesces to the Lord and says, if the Lord wants a temple, I'll send his people back and build him a temple. Here's a king, pagan king, who at least acknowledges God's in control. And so he makes this proclamation, and a group of exiles return. It's about 47,000 people that return in this first wave of, of people coming back to Jerusalem. You can see the figures uh, if you look on pa uh, chapter 2, verses 64 and 65. You can see there's 42,360 individuals. Besides the servants, there's another 7,337. And so roughly 47 to 50,000 people are coming back. And when they return, in chapter 3, we see that they begin to rebuild the temple. Chapter 3, verse 2, 
you'll notice a couple familiar names from our study of Chronicles. It says, Then arose Jeshua, the son of jo- Josadak, with his fellow priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, with his kinsmen. So the, the priest and the heir to the throne are back in the land. And what do they do? Verse 3, They set the altar in its place. So they haven't rebuilt the temple yet, but they put an altar there. And they offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord, morning and evening. And they kept the feast of booths, as it is written, and offered the daily burnt offerings by number according to the rule for each day. And then verse 6, From the first day of the seventh month, they began to offer burnt offerings to the Lord, but the foundation of the temple of the Lord was not yet laid. So they, they make offerings to thank God that he's brought them back into the land. And then in verse 8, we see they begin to rebuild the temple. And so they, they begin to rebuild. They appoint Levites for the uh, supervision of the task. In verse 10, we get this scene where they've laid the foundation. They're going to celebrate. So chapter 3, verse 10 says, And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments came forward with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals, to praise the Lord according to the directions of David, king of Israel. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and heads of fathers' houses, old men who had seen the first house, wept with a loud voice when they saw the foundations of this house being laid, though many shouted for joy. So the people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shout from the sound of the people's weeping. For the people shouted with great shout, and it was heard far away. And so we have this bittersweet, mixed emotion moment where the younger generation, who didn't see the first temple, say, wow, we have a spot. We've got a temple. This is amazing. But the older generation, who remembers the first temple in all its glory, and who remembers the presence of the Lord being there, they're weeping. Why? Well, because this temple will pale in comparison to Solomon's temple. Herod will try to renovate it to make it look more beautiful, but it's never going to be the same as the one that Solomon had built. And secondly, when Solomon's temple is built, and when the tabernacle was built, they saw the visible presence of God descend on the place. And it gave them assurance that the Lord was with them. But there's no such sign for them here. And so they're left wondering, Will God dwell in this temple? Will, will he be here as he was in the last temple? And so it's a question on their mind. And so that's why the old men weep when they see the temple. They're wondering, will it ever be the same? Will he be in that close proximity to us again? And we don't get an answer in this particular text. But chapter 4 tells us then about some adversaries that come. And now these adversaries that arise... Uh, They don't want to see Jerusalem return to its former glory. They don't want to see the people return to their rightful place. And so they oppose Zerubbabel and the rebuilding here. And uh, much like uh, a younger sibling telling on their older brother, here their solution is to write a letter to the king and say, do you know what those guys are doing? They're trying to rebuild the temple. They're going to rebel against you. Look through the history of this people. They're a rebellious people. You can't trust them. And so that's the scheme. That's the tactic that they try to use. And and it works for a time. The king orders for the work to cease for a period of time. Uh, But after they clear up things, Darius orders the work to begin once again. And uh, in chapter 5, we see the building begin once again. And notice chapter 5, verse 1. We have two other prophets mentioned here. We've got to take note of. So now the prophets Haggai and Zechariah prophesied to the Jews who were in Jerusalem and Judah in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. And then they began to rebuild. Now Haggai and Zechariah, if you're looking for where they speak about the temple, Haggai chapter 2 and Zechariah chapter 4, both of them prophesy that the temple will be built. And so they are correct in that. The temple is built. And then chapter 5, verse 5, it says, But the eye of their God was on the elders of the Jews, and they did not stop them until the report should reach Darius and an answer by the letter concerning it. 
So they, they, they begin building once again, and the, the guys try the same sort of schemes to get the temple construction to cease. And that goes on for a period of time. And then we reach chapter 7. So the, they've been working, they complete the temple, they try to reinstitute some of the practices, but uh, once the temple is completed, there's a gap for a period of time. And so if you look at the end of chapter 6, beginning of chapter 7, you'll notice that they begin to celebrate once again the Passover. They begin to keep the feasts once again. And it says, The Lord made them joyful and had turned the heart of the king of Assyria to them. So he aided them in the work of the house of God, the God of Israel. And it looks like maybe just a moment passes between chapter 6, verse 22, and chapter 7, verse 1. It's actually 57 years between these two chapters. And now the second wave is going to be coming back with Ezra. And so Ezra is commissioned to go back and reinstitute temple worship. And so we want to notice the time gap there. It says Ezra went up from Babylon. For, and then notice the end of verse 6. It says the king granted Ezra all that he asked for the hand of the Lord his God was on him. So Ezra asks the king for everything necessary to to begin the, te the temple worship again and to renew the hearts of the people, the king gives it all to him. As we keep on reading, at the end of this, midway through this chapter, it's describing Ezra accumulating what's necessary for the return. And it says this in chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. It says this. Now, you, you might remember verse 10, if you're with us for Bible study methods. Pastor Mark taught on that verse. But it says this in verse 9. The good hand of his God was on him. God's active involve, involvement helping Ezra to acquire what's necessary to return. For, for Ezra, so here's why God was with him. For Ezra had set in his heart to study the law of the Lord, to do it, and to teach his statutes and rules in Israel. And so this is a model for what it looks like to seek the Lord in his word. First, we study it. If we don't know what we're saying, we're going to be a heretic. We've got to know what he says. Secondly, we have to do it. If we don't do it, we're hypocrites. So we study, so we know what God says. We obey it, so we're not hypocritical. And then we teach it. We bear fruit as we teach others. And so that's the model for what it looks like to study God's word. Ezra has a heart to do this and to teach the people. And so he's the right person. He's the right person for this period of time to lead God's people. And what I want you to catch at the end of chapter 7 then uh, look at verses 27 and 28. You're going to notice the, the pronoun switch here now that Ezra is back in Jerusalem. It says, Blessed be the Lord, the God of our fathers, who put such a thing as this into the heart of the king to beautify the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem, and who extended to me his steadfast love before the king and his counselors, and before all the king's mighty officers. I took courage. For the hand of the Lord my God was on me, and I gathered leading men from Israel to go up with me. So notice the first person, this is Ezra speaking, and so whether he's the inspired author or the author's using his journal, we see this is what Ezra is thinking as he begins to go back and reinstitute the worship of God in Jerusalem. So the people have returned with Zerubbabel, and they built, rebuilt the rubble. Under Ezra, they reinstitute worship of God in that place. And so that's what happens there in the book of Ezra. And during this period of time, during that, that gap, that uh, portion of silence, the book of Esther happens in the meantime. While, while Ezra is being written, while uh, the events of Ezra are happening, the book, of, the book of Esther happens. And Esther is a remarkable little book. You know, Ruth and Esther, these short little books named after women in the Bible, but they're remarkable works of literature. And so the title of the book of Esther refers to the key figure in the book, Esther. Authorship is unknown, but in this book of Esther, we know that this person, whoever wrote it, understands Jewish culture and Persian culture very well. So they know Persian customs and Jewish nationalism well. And uh, one thing you got to catch about Esther is that God's name is not mentioned, which is why many times when, when theologians or, or scholars are looking at this book, they say, how can this book properly be in, in the scripture if it doesn't even name God in the book? But when we read the book, I think you'll notice that God is present in the book. He might not be named, but the book begs for us to notice God's hand at work. 
And so Esther takes place during this period of time. So this is what's happening over here in, in Persia while the Jews are, are rebuilding the temple and while Ezra is instituting worship. The book of Esther is happening. And the book of Esther is written in what we call a chiasm. So it's a form where it's like a sandwich. And the best part of a sandwich is in the middle. The best part of Esther is in the middle. That's the turning point, the crux of the story, the climax of the story. And so we see that there's a mirror happening throughout the story. So the book begins by telling us about this king. And the king is great. And uh, he decides that he's going to have a feast. And at this feast, he wants his wife to come and uh, show off her beauty before all of his drunk friends at this feast. Queen Vashti says, no thank you. I don't, want, I don't want to be entertainment for your drunk friends. And so the king orders that Vashti be ousted from the kingdom and that a beauty pageant will begin to find the new queen. And so we thought reality shows were something new. They had reality shows all the way back in Persia. So they have a beauty pageant. Esther wins. Uh, she's the most beautiful. So she becomes the queen. And uh, then we meet this man named Haman. Haman's evil. Haman's awful. Haman hates Mordecai in particular. He doesn't get along with them. And so Haman, because of his hatred for Mordecai, because Mordecai wouldn't bow before Haman when Haman would walk down the street, and Haman, because he was an official of Persia, that was something you were supposed to do for him. But Mordecai, I don't bow to anyone but God. And so Haman doesn't like that. So he decides, I'm going to take care of this Mordecai. And he convinces the king to issue a decree that all, that all the Jews are, are going to be slaughtered because the Jews are troublemakers in, in Haman's estimation. And so Haman gets the king to issue this decree. Chapter 4, we see that Esther and Mordecai find out about the decree, and they try to come up with a plan to figure out what needs to happen here. And that's where this profound statement takes place, where Mordecai says this to Esther. He's, he's trying to convince Esther that she needs to go in and approach the king. In Persian custom, if you approach the king without being summoned, you could be executed on the spot. And so he makes this statement to Esther, do I give her courage? And he says this, who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this? He's saying, who knows, Esther, maybe this is your purpose. Maybe you were designed for this. Maybe someone's hand has placed you here for this. Who would place her there? It's obviously God. And so Haman, er, Mordecai is alluding to God's hand, God's providence, God's design behind the scenes in the seeming coincidences of life, saying this could be the reason God gave you your beauty. This could be the reason God put you in that contest. This could be the reason that God has elevated you to become the queen of a foreign kingdom to save his people at this period of time. And so... With the plan together, Esther comes up with a plan. She's going to have a couple of different banquets. She goes in and approaches the king. The king extends his staff, indicating you're not going to die. I would like to hear what you have to say. Esther invites the king and Haman to a banquet. And Haman's feeling good. The queen invited me and the king to a banquet. How awesome am I? It's just me and the king and the queen. I'm a great guy. And so he's dreaming about all the rewards, all the riches that he's going to get, all the honor he could have. And meanwhile, he sets up a spike in his front yard because when it's time to kill the Jews, he's going he's to skewer Mordecai on that spike in his front yard. And so while this is going on, the next day, as they awake, Haman comes in to the king's, uh, to the king's chambers there, and the king had trouble sleeping last night. And because he had trouble sleeping, he had someone read to him the scroll, the history of his kingship. And in that scroll, it's discovered that Mordecai saved his life and was never rewarded for it. He, he foiled an assassination plot. And so the king says, you know, Haman, what should I do for someone who pleases the king? And so Mor Haman, not knowing that the king is thinking about Mordecai, Haman says, well, give him your finest robe and, and a beautiful ring and, and put him on a white horse and have one of the king's highest men parade him through the city saying, this is a man the king is pleased with. And so the king says, that sounds great. Okay, Haman, do that for Mordecai. And so Haman is humiliated in doing this, leading the man he hates through the city saying, the king is pleased with him. The king is pleased with him. In the midst of chapter 6 then, 
Esther reveals to the king Haman's plot, that Haman has desired to kill Mordecai and all the Jews, and that Esther herself is a Jew. So the king is enraged, and he has, he has Haman skewered on that spike he had intended for Mordecai. And so, that's, and so uh, then they come up with a plan to reverse the decree. They make an order saying the Jews can defend themselves and you're not supposed to attack them. Um, so that, that takes place in chapter 8 here. Mordecai is now elevated to the status that Haman had, and Mordecai's greatness is declared in the final chapters. And so the whole book hinges around this twist of fate, or twist of God's providential hand. Coincidentally, everything Haman intended for Mordecai, he received himself. And everything that Haman intended for himself, Mordecai receives. So we see the hand of God. It's on display in this book. And so the key verse there. Who knows? God knows. God put you there for this time, Esther. So that's the book of Esther. God's still at work. Even in a foreign land, God's still at work. And then we go to Nehemiah. And Nehemiah covers that final return of the people from from Persia to the promised land, to Jerusalem. Uh, Nehemiah, many people think that Nehemiah and Ezra are actually one book, uh, or were, were intended to be one book, or were written by one author, because a lot of the themes uh, draw through the entire text there. So uh, the title of the book refers to Nehemiah, who leads the third return from captivity. Authorship, it's likely Ezra. If we, if we decide that if, if Ezra is indeed the author of Ezra, then he's probably also the author of Nehemiah. Whoever wrote Ezra also wrote Nehemiah. And it's likely written around this period of time, 400 B.C., covers that final return, and the hand of the Lord theme carries through the book of Nehemiah. So as you're going through Nehemiah and, Ez- and Ezra, make sure you're circling that verse as it comes up when you see that phrasing, the hand of the Lord. But Nehemiah, page 139, is where we have the structure of this book. Uh, the first seven chapters deal with rebuilding the wall, and oftentimes you'll hear this book when, we're pe- when people are doing capital campaigns. I was, I was just talking with another pastor, and uh, he was saying, yeah, we just got finished preaching the book of Nehemiah, and no, we weren't doing a building campaign, we weren't doing capital campaign, but that's stereotypically, that's where your people are going when they're doing the capital campaign. But Nehemiah rebuilds the walls, and then chapters 8 through 13, they renew the people once again. So the people have drifted from their regular worship, from their regular worship of the Lord. And so Ezra and Nehemiah together help renew the people back to God. So that's the structure of the book. First seven, we're building. Conclusion, we're worshiping. So Nehemiah, chapter one. Um, Nehemiah is uh, cupbearer to the king. We get this information in the very last verse of chapter one. And so he has a a position of a high, high amount of trust. The cupbearer would be the person who would taste the king's food before the king did. And so he's, he's basically a shield for poison. If Nehemiah lives, okay, great. Now the king can eat because you didn't die. It must not be poisoned. And so he's a trusted person because uh, the king is trusting that, that Nehemiah is not going to poison him. So he has a high level of trust from the king. And in chapter 1, verse 3, a remnant returns from Jerusalem, and they bring report to Nehemiah on what's happening in Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there, and notice the first person, this is from Nehemiah's own writings, and they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates are destroyed by fire. So the stone wall has been broken down, the wooden gates are burned, Verse 4, as soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes be open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants. Confessing the sin of the people, which we have sinned against you, even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments and statutes and rules that you have commanded. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples, but 
if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them. Though your, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place I have chosen to make my name dwell. They are your servants and your people, whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear you, to fear your name and give success to your servant today. Grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Now, I was cupbearer to the king. So one thing you're going to notice is that as we read Nehemiah, many of the portions are excerpts from his from his journal. They've either been copied or, or pasted in here. But we see the hand of God. He's trusting the strong hand of God to help him in this return. And so the report from Jerusalem comes, and it's not a good report. The walls are in disarray. He's weeping over this. And then in chapter 2, uh, he's standing there before the king, and the king notices he's visibly distressed. Nehemiah is visibly distressed. And he says, what's wrong? And in chapter 2, verse 3, Nehemiah tells him, Let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? So the king then asks him, Well, what would you like to do? Verse 5, If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, that you send me to Judah, the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. And the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, How long will you be gone, and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me when I had given him a time. So God gives favor to Nehemiah. If you look at chapter uh, 2, verse 8, very end of the chapter, it says, And the king granted me what I asked, for the good hand of my God was upon me. We've heard that from Ezra twice. Now we hear it from the, the lips of Nehemiah. The good hand of God is with him. And so Nehemiah returns to Jerusalem. And when he returns, he doesn't tell anyone what he's there to do. And so he's silent about his mission, his task. And as he returns, at night, he goes outside the city. And the blue line here, if you're in the study Bible, 587 is where you'll find this map. And he goes out at night to inspect the damage. It's going to be pretty obvious what he's going to do what he's going to do if someone sees him, like, measuring the wall and looking all around, like, oh, it seems like he's really interested in the wall. So he does it at night because he wants for himself to see what the task is at hand. Comes out of the gate there. You'll see the description in the text of how he exits and circles the, the city, goes past each of these gates, and observes the places where the wall is still broken down. And so he understands the task at hand. And then as it continues, we notice that opposition mounts. So Nehemiah tells, tells the remnant the plan. We're going to rebuild the walls. We can't have our city lie in ruins like this. The walls uh, have several meanings in, in that ancient Near Eastern culture. Walls would mean, first of all, protection. It's harder to hurt you if there's a giant stone wall between you and the person trying to hurt you. So protection is one. But also honor. Uh, prestigious cities had walls. And so it was a shame to have the walls of your city broken down. It was, it was a derision to a people to have walls that were broken down. And so in Nehemiah's estimation, it's for the protection of our people and also for the fame of the name of God. We want to rebuild the walls of this city that is God's city. And so they purpose to do that. And there's instant opposition to the work. We see that there's three people opposing him. We've got Sanballat and uh, Tobiah. And who's the third guy? Three guys there, they're opposing the work. Sambalot, Tobiah. Shout it out if you see it before I find it in the text here. Geshem. Yeah, thank you. Sambalot, Tobiah, and Geshem are opposing the work. And uh, so much so that Nehemiah ends up telling the people that they're going to be building and have a sword in the other hand. So your trowel in one hand to build the bricks, and your sword in the other hand, so, so you're ready. Maybe it wasn't actually in your hand the whole time, but strapped on. Your sword was with you. You were ready to fight in case enemies came. And so the opposition is, uh, is mostly just threats. But in chapter 4, verse 14, we see the, uh, what, what's said to the people there. Here's what Nehemiah says to the people. He says, Do not be afraid of them, these three that are opposing, Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome, 
and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. You could put that in Braveheart. That's a good speech. Don't be afraid. Remember, the Lord is great and awesome. He's on your side. If you're on his side, he's on your side. And fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, your homes. And you'll notice the wisdom of Nehemiah too. He has each person building the spot, the chunk of the wall that's close to their house. And so that way you have personal uh, skin in the game. If this piece of the wall is set, it's going to be harder to get to my house in particular. And so there's wisdom there. And chapter 6, there's a number of conspiracies and opposition that Nehemiah faces. But in chapter 6, I think what's remarkable, well, chapter 5, verse 19, let's look at that one. There's a number of moments in here where we recognize that some of what we are reading is Nehemiah's prayer to God as he's recording the events of his life. So chapter 5, verse 19, Remember for my good, O oh my God, all that I have done for this people. Following the conspiracy. Ch- chapter 6, verse 9. But now, O oh God, strengthen my hands. Again, we see hands at play and God's work. In chapter 6, verse 14, Remember Tobiah and Sanballat, O my God, according to these things that they did, and also the prophetess Noadiah and the rest of the prophets who wanted to make me afraid. False prophets who were opposing him. And so we see Nehemiah reliant on God in the midst of this and, and opposing a number of great schemes against him. And so it's amazing to me that we get glimpses into Nehemiah's heart throughout this process of rebuilding the walls. And, and as I was reading it, it made me think about Augustine's confessions. I don't know if you've, you've heard of St. Augustine, an early church father, uh, but his greatest work was a book called The Confessions. And it's a first-person confession to God, testimonial on, on how great God is. And it begins with this phrase, Great are you, Lord, and greatly to be praised. And so I just think of that. When I read the words of of Nehemiah, I think, I wonder if Augustine's echoing Nehemiah there. So, Nehemiah, he's trusting in God. We see glimpses into his heart in the midst of this. And then in chapter 8, the walls have been completed. And the walls, the walls were, when the walls are finished, you'll notice that they they say this. Uh, This is from chapter 6, verse 15, the moment when the walls are completed. It says, So the wall was finished, on the 25th day of the month of Elul, in 52 days. How long does it take to build a house in America with machines and contractors? Here, 52 days to rebuild the walls. And when all our enemies heard of it, all the nations around us were afraid, and they fell greatly in their own esteem. You see what happens? They say, whoa, whoa. Do you see what their God did? We are maybe not that great. They fell greatly in their own esteem, for they perceived that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. Absolutely it was. So the hand of God helps them to finish the wall. And then when we get to chapter 8, now they're going to reinstitute worship. And so Ezra has returned. He's set in his heart to study the law, to do it, and to teach it. Now we get to see Ezra teaching the people the law in chapter 8 here. So, chapter 8 of Nehemiah, it says, All the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. So the people gather here expectantly. They're eager to hear what God has to say to them. And so Ezra gets up. He's on a platform that they've constructed for this purpose, to hear the law read to them. It says, And he read from it, facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday, in the presence of the men and the women and all those who could understand. And all the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. Have you ever listened to a sermon that goes on for a long time and our mind begins to wander? How long does it take for your attention span? Is it 15 minutes? 30 minutes? 
Here they're listening for an entire morning, from early morning until noon, hearing the word of the law. And are they drifting off and falling asleep? What does the text tell us? They were attentive to the book of the law. They recognized, this is something I am desperate for. I need God's word. I need his law. And so this desperation makes them attentive. The, the people listen attentively as Ezra reads the law to them. And so he's up on the platform that they've made for that purpose, verse 4 tells us. Verse 5, And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And as he opened it, all the people stood. And Ezra blessed the, lo the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. All right, so we've got a charismatic service. They're responding. <laughs> no, not charismatic. But they're responsive, right? They're interacting as he's preaching. They're invested in it. Amen, amen. And so they're, they're in it. And they bowed their heads, and they worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. What happens? The people gathered expectantly. They listened attentively, and they respond properly to the word. They hear God's word, and they say amen. They affirm it. That's intellectual assent. They bow down and they worship. And then it says to us that these people, this group of people who are teaching with Ezra, they help the people to understand the law while the people remain in their places. Verse 8, they read from the book, from the law of God clearly, and they gave the sense so that people understood the reading. They made them understand the text. And so Ezra is teaching, and then verse 9 it says, And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra, the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. Why are they weeping? They understand how far they have strayed. Their, their hearts are convicted by the divine inspired word of God being read before them. And so they say, listen, this is supposed to be a joyful day. You have the Lord's words again. And so we understand the conviction you're feeling, but don't weep. The right response now is to thankfulness and joy. And so notice as they keep on, as we keep on reading that verse, verse 10, it says, go your way, eat, eat the fat, drink sweet wine, and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready for this day as holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the Lord, uh, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites calmed the people down, saying, Be quiet, for this day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink, and to send portions, and to make great rejoicing, because they had understood the words that were declared to them. They had to remind their people to go have lunch after church. They had to remind them, hey, go enjoy, ha have a meal together, celebrate. We have the word of the Lord. This is a joyful day. They're celebrating together because they understood the words that were declared to them. They got it. They understood what God was saying to them. And so we see this renewal happening among the people. And then in chapter 9, after this reading of the word, in chapter 9, so Ezra reads the law, and here's something Alistair says about this particular chapter, chapter 8. What we notice is this, the real problem was not the broken wall, but the spiritual apathy of the people. And it's beginning to change in chapter 8. We see that the people are, are grieved, and they have to be instructed to be joyful, and so the apathy of the people is beginning to change in, verse, in chapter 8. And so we get to chapter 9 then, and the people pray and confess. And chapter 9 is, is a great one if you want a one-chapter summary of Old Testament history. I mean, this chapter, so Nehemiah chapter 9, and then uh, Stephen's speech in Acts 7, those are probably the two most concise histories of Israel that you can find in the Bible. But I want you to catch, they're praying to God, and, and one thing you've got to catch as you're reading chapter 9, they're speaking to God, declaring all the wondrous things you have done, God, and then all the wrong that they have done, the people. So I just want to read a portion of this for you. It says this. Chapter 9. We'll start in, in verse 5. It says, the, the group here speaks to the people, and they say, Stand up and bless the Lord, your God, from everlasting to everlasting. 
Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. You are the Lord. You alone. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their host, the earth and all that is in it, the seas and all that is in them. And you preserve all of them. And the host of heaven worships you. Your creator, your sustainer, they said. Verse 7, you are the Lord, the God who chose Abraham and brought him out of Ur, the Chaldeans, and gave him the name Abraham. You found his heart faithful before you. You made with him the covenant to give his offspring the land of the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Perizzite, the Jebusite, and the Girgashite. And you have kept your promise, for you are righteous. And you saw the affliction of our fathers in Egypt and heard their cry at the Red Sea and performed signs and wonders against Pharaoh and all his servants and all the people of this land. For you knew that they acted arrogantly against our fathers. And you made a name for yourself, as is to this day. And you divided the sea before them. So they went out through the midst of the sea on dry land. You cast their pursuers into the depths as a stone into mighty waters. By a pillar of cloud, you led them in the day. And by fire in the night, to light for them the way in which they should go. You came down on Mount Sinai, and spoke with them from heaven, and gave them right rules and true laws, good statutes and commandments, and you made known to them your holy Sabbath, and commanded them the commandments and statutes, a law by Moses, your servant. You gave them bread from heaven for their hunger, and brought them water out of the rock for their thirst. You told them to go in and possess the land that you had sworn to give them. But they and our fathers acted presumptuously and stiffened their neck and did not obey. They refused to obey and were not mindful of the wonders that you performed among them. They stiffened their neck and appointed a leader to return to their slavery in Egypt. But you are a God ready to forgive gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and did not forsake them even when they had made for themselves a golden calf and said, this is your God who brought you up out of Egypt and had committed great blasphemies. You, in your great mercies, did not forsake them in the wilderness. Verse 20, you gave your good spirit to instruct them. Verse 22, you gave them kingdoms and peoples and allotted to them every corner verse 23, you multiplied their children as the stars of heaven, and you brought them into the land. Verse 24, you subdued before them the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites. End of verse 25. So they ate and were filled and became fat and delighted themselves in your great goodness. Verse 26, nevertheless, they were disobedient and rebelled against you, cast your law behind their back, and killed your prophets. You gave them into the hand of their enemies. You heard from heaven. You gave them saviors who saved. We're counting the times of the judges here. Verse 28, but after they had rest, they did evil again before you, and you abandoned them to the hand of their enemies. So So they had dominion over them. Yet when they turned and cried to you, you heard from heaven, and many times you delivered them according to, their mercy, to your mercies. Verse 29, And you warned them in order to turn back to your law, yet they acted presumptuously and did not obey. Verse 30, Many years you bore with them and warned them by your spirit through your prophets, yet they would not give ear. Therefore, you gave them into the hand of the peoples of the lands, Nevertheless, in your great mercies, you did not make an end of them or forsake them, for you are a gracious and merciful God. Now, therefore, our God, the great, the mighty, the awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love, let not all the hardship seem little to you that has come upon us, upon our kings, our princes, our priests, our prophets, our fathers, and all your people, since the time of the kings of Assyria until this day. 
yet you have been righteous in all that has come upon us, for you have dealt faithfully when we have acted wickedly. Isn't that amazing? You were faithful when we were wicked. You were good when we were bad. Verse 38, we'll conclude at the end of the chapter, says this, because of all of this, we make a firm covenant in writing on the sealed document are the names of our princes, our Levites, and our priests. What's their purpose? Their purpose is to worship God, to honor him for who he is. Isn't that remarkable to see from the the great, great, great grandkids' perspective all the history of the family and how God's faithful all the way through, even when we are faithless all the way through. That's remarkable, and I love that statement. You have been faithful when we have acted wickedly. It's a good summary verse for the history of Israel here. And so following this great moment, they reinstitute the covenant, they reinstitute worship, they're celebrating the Feast of Booths once again. They appoint leaders, and Nehemiah goes back to Persia for a period of time. And when Nehemiah returns from Persia, if you've read chapter 13, he returns from Persia, and many of the sins that were happening before are beginning to happen again. And so the vision has leaked, the passion for God has leaked, and they've stopped celebrating the Sabbaths. And so Nehemiah has to set guards at the gates to shut the gates so they can't go out and work the fields on the Sabbath. And we see that the people are beginning to to marry those who are not followers of the one true God. And it reflects on Solomon's divided heart. And so we see the very sins that led Israel down this dark path, they're beginning to taste once again. And so Nehemiah throws a fit and and tries to bring them back toward God. He begins to to beat up some of these men who are doing these things. At the end, Nehemiah says this. Chapter 13, verse 29. Remember them, O my God, because they have desecrated the priesthood and the covenant of the priests and Levites. So thus I cleansed them from every, everything foreign. I established the duties of the priests and Levites, each in his work. I provided wood for the offering at the appointed times and for the first fruits. Remember me, O oh my God, for good. So God, remember, I tried. I tried with these people. I tried, Lord. And that's how the book of Nehemiah ends. That's how the, the narrative portion of the history of the Old Testament end. And so we're left, we're left with a story that's begging for a conclusion. And God intends for it that way because the conclusion hasn't come until Christ has come. And so as we look at these questions, okay, so we've looked at Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. We've re- it's an emotional roller coaster going through the people's resurgence towards God and their hearts begin to fade. And their, their resurgence towards God and their hearts begin to fade. Who is God? How does it point to Jesus? And how do we see the story of salvation in this book? Why don't you just take, take a minute, talk to someone next to you about these three books. Where do you see God, Jesus, and the story of salvation? Go ahead and do that now. Well, I know there was a short period of time there, but any initial thoughts on who God is in this particular book? Yeah, no, that's a great observation. Yeah, God's faithfulness is on display through this book in spite of all the vacillating back and forth of the people, the double-mindedness, he's faithful. Amen. Great point. Yeah, excellent. Renate, did you have something too? Okay, yeah, you saw God's hand at work in, in all three books. Yeah, excellent. That's great. Yeah, Pat. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, so the Philippian, the comment is the Philippians passage. It's God who works in us to will and to work for his good pleasure. And so you can see God at work in the hand of the kings in, in orchestrating the circumstances of the life of Esther and the rebuilding of the wall in 52 days. Absolutely. Yeah, we see God on display there. How, how about Jesus in the book? Where do you see this book pointing forward to Christ? That's a great observation. Yeah, Nehemiah goes in and cleans out the temple because they had set up a foreign person's shop in there, and Christ goes in and cleans the temple as well. Absolutely, that's a great connection. Yeah. How about the last one then? Any thoughts on how this fits the story of salvation? Yeah, that's a great observation. Antithesis, a foil to the New Jerusalem. New Jerusalem, 
it arrives like a bride coming out of heaven, and here they're working, slaving away, sword in one hand, trowel in the other. That's great observation. Well, here's, here's a couple thoughts I had on these three books. First one is, who is God? God's the sovereign orchestrator of all history. We see his hand at play, on display, throughout all these books. So Ezra and Nehemiah, it's overtly, and the author's pointing out to us, we saw the hand of the Lord, the hand of God, the hand of God. Do you see him working? And so the author points out to us explicitly, as many times as he can, that God's orchestrating. And even in Esther, we see God is the one with these seeming coincidences, God is the one pulling it all together. He's the one who's put her in that spot. And so he's in control. He's working his plan. How does it point to Jesus? His work is the only cure for our sin-sick hearts. At the end of that book of, of Nehemiah, I thought, wow, what a, I wish it ended in chapter 9. I wish it ended there. I wish we didn't have to see them begin to drift again. But it's a reminder. It's a story that's begging for the conclusion, which is Christ's work and Christ's return. And so how do we see it in the story of salvation? These books beg for a God-centered work and ending. Because we think about the ending. This is the end of, of the Old Testament narrative books, the end. Well, we have, we have questions. When will the people finally love and obey God? Well, when they get that heart transplant. When, when will the true king finally return? Well, he, he comes twice. He, we saw his first advent in, in Christ when he comes and dies. They thought that was going to be the moment where he reigns. That's why they were confused, but we're longing for the king to return. And lastly, when will God finally dwell on the earth? When will he reign here with his people? That's what we're longing for. So that's, that's one thing I love about these narrative books, the Old Testament. It's a story without an ending, because the ending is bound up in Christ. It all points to Jesus. And so that's a beautiful thing. So those are the narrative books of the Old Testament. This has been part one of Story of the Old Testament. And so what does that mean? What does that mean? Well, for next semester, in the fall, this is our last class. Can you believe it? In the fall, we're going to be looking at Story of the Old Testament, part two, the poetry and wisdom books. So poetry and wisdom, we'll see where those fit within, within this narrative timeline. But now that you have this down, now you understand the, the sequence of events. Now we're going to see how these other pieces fit in there. So that's in the fall. You'll, you can look forward to that coming. And this Sunday, Pastor Mark is preaching on the Jesus you never knew. So looking at the pre-incarnate Christ, the incarnate Christ, the glorified Christ, and the returning Christ. So it's going to be a great one. Join us for that. Let me pray. Lord, thank you so much for this night and for these weeks that we've had, beholding the wonder of who you are. I pray that you would help us to continue to grow in that knowledge and love of you and, and that we would uh, rely on you as the only one who can cure our sin-sick hearts. You're the only one who can pay for our sin. And Lord, would you help us to have a longing for your work in our lives and for your reign, Lord. And so we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thank you all. See you next semester. Wow.